This is the sixth in a series of messages called Beginnings based on the book of Genesis. Let me review where we begin. The book of Genesis begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It tells us the universe has not always existed. Uh, God began things. He created things. In Genesis uh, chapter 3, we see that uh, uh, everything God created was good, and then Adam and Eve sinned. They were led into a deception by Satan, and so we learn from that that sin nature has now spread to every human being in this world. The, the, the chaos, uh, the evil we see in our world is caused by human sin and the activity of Satan stirring up trouble. In Genesis chapter 4, we encountered the first murder in the uh, world. Uh, Cain killed his brother Abel. Now turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 4. Uh, we have Bibles under the seats as well. In verse uh, 17, we read, Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. So Cain is building a city. You don't build city unless you have people. Uh, so humankind is growing at this point. Uh, verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play stringed instruments and pipes. So they had their first orchestra at that point. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Naamah. And so creation is becoming, uh, civilization is becoming more sophisticated. We have stringed instruments. We have uh, tools of bronze and iron. Now turn to Genesis chapter 5. We see there the genealogy from Adam to Noah. I don't think we're to understand this as being successive. Uh, it just kind of, Genesis hits the highlights. Uh, there may have been many generations that uh, were not recorded. Then chapter 6. We read, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them. So civilization is growing. I think we could understand there may be uh, 10,000 people or, or so at this time. The sons of God, this would be a reference to angels, saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. So Remember, we saw a couple weeks ago that Satan and a third of the angels uh, uh, rebelled against God, and they were kicked out of heaven and came down to earth where Satan has been allowed to rule until Christ comes again. Uh, and uh, so if you, if you ever read something in the Bible, you say, boy, I don't even get that, you can just type in, uh, to your cell phone, you know, give me other references to that same subject and see what you find. Uh, and so we find that Jude, one of Jesus' half-brothers, uh, speaks about this, this uh, Genesis 6. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So Jude's commenting on what Moses says in Genesis chapter 6 that these uh, angels were out of place uh, in interacting with, with human beings and marrying with them. Peter also talks about these uh, spirits. After being made alive, Jesus went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. So Peter says these Spirits, where we're talking about these angels, are now imprisoned. And when were they? They were in the days of Noah. Then chapter uh, 6, back to Genesis, uh, verse uh, 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. So the lifespan of human beings has, has been shortened by God. If you read through Genesis 5, you see people were living 5, 6, 7, 800, 900 years. Now he says it's going to be closer to 100. Uh, from Genesis, back to Genesis 3, verse 5, we read, For God knows that when you eat from it, uh, this is uh, 
uh, Satan is talking to Eve. God knows that when you eat from it, the tree, uh, the fruit from the tree, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And then at the end, after they had uh, sinned against him, God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and also take from the tree of life and eat and live uh, forever. Uh, so God is shortening uh, the, the lifespan of human beings and uh, not allowing uh, them to develop immortality. Uh, then in chapter uh, 6, verse 4, uh, where is that? <clears throat> the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. Uh, the Nephilim are giants. We read about them when... Uh, uh, Moses brought the people into the land of Canaan, and they, they gave a report to, to Moses. That the pe people there are like giants. We saw them. We feel like grasshoppers. Remember uh, uh, Goliath was nine feet, six feet tall, uh, six inches tall? Uh, so uh, anyway, this is the beginning of them. Uh, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. So apparently these uh, giants uh, were, were came... Uh, from them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Uh, verse 5, the Lord God saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So sin has spread and it's increased. He says, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Verse 12, God saw how corrupt the earth had become. It's become a nightmare for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Now God's going to destroy humanity with a flood, but it seems like human beings have already pretty much destroyed themselves. Verse 6, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them. Uh, the fact that uh, humans not only will be uh, destroyed, but all animals shows that we're all in this together. Uh, and this is God's characteristic way of dealing with evil. He doesn't take half measures. He sent his son to die on the cross for all the sin in the world. Uh, so now we're going to read the story of Noah and God bringing judgment on the earth through a flood. Noah is undoubtedly one of the best known characters in the Bible. If you grew up in the church, you went to Sunday school, you uh, heard the story of Noah. Because it's related to one of the greatest tragedies in the history of humankind. You say, you know, this is one of the reasons I'm not a Christian. I don't believe the stories that I read about in the Bible. They're myths. They're just made up. Uh, and uh, if God's going to destroy all of humankind because people have been sinful, why would anybody want to follow a God like that? Well, now we have extra biblical reasons, uh, you know, reasons besides what we read in the Bible for why we can believe in Noah and the flood. We have uh, evidence from over 250 cultures of uh, a belief in a flood. Uh, even uh, the most famous one is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, even people living far from the ocean, like the Hopi Indians in, in uh, southwest United States or, or the uh, Incas in the Peruvian Andes, have stories about a flood coming over their whole land, even covering their mountains until virtually all life uh, came to an end. The best explanation for this is that there was a worldwide flood. In 1922, an English uh, archaeologist 
named Sir Leonard Woolley led an expedition to the city of Ur in Mesopotamia from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, they were digging down and finding, uh, you know, for fragments from earlier civilizations. Then they hit a, a patch of clay where there was nothing. And the Arab workman in the pit said, uh, Sir Woolley, we should go to another place. There's just nothing here. It's just plain clay, pure clay. But he uh, said, no, keep digging. And they dug down through eight feet of pure clay, and then they began to hit flint implements and, and pieces of pottery. Uh, and so Willie got down in the pit and he examined it and he called a couple of his staff over. He says, how do you explain this? Eight feet of pure silt. So I don't, they said, we don't know. So he asked his wife. She says, that's easy. The flood. That, said Willie, was the right answer. And sure enough, they... Uh, uh, microscopic analysis showed that the thick layer of clean silt had indeed been deposited by floodwaters, a deluge that was so extensive that it wiped away uh, earlier Sumerian civilization. So here's geologic evidence to support the Genesis account that there was a worldwide flood. Then in the early 1970s, two American ships were pulled up uh, from the Gulf of Mexico, containing several long, slender cores of sediment. Included in them were the shells of tiny one-celled planktonic organisms called foraminifera. While living on the surface, these organisms lock into their shells a chemical record of the salinity of the water. When they reproduce, the shells are discarded and dropped to the bottom. A cross-section of that bottom, which is what a sedimentary core is, carries a record of climates and salinity that may go back tens of thousands of years. The cores were analyzed by Cesar Emiliani of the University of Miami and James Kennett of the University of Rhode Island. Both found a dramatic change in salinity, providing compelling evidence of a vast flood of fresh water spilling into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, geochemist Jerry Stipps of the University of Miami dated the sediments at about 11,600 years ago, which is about when we would think the flood occurred. Emiliani says that we know a vast amount of fresh water poured into the Gulf of Mexico. We know this, quote, because the oxygen isotope ratios of the foraminifera shells show a marked temporary decrease in the salinity of the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. He says this is good evidence that there was a flood maybe 12,000, 10,000 years ago. Uh, and in his estimation, there's little doubt that there was a flood. Now, the bigger, biggest reason we can believe uh, that there was a flood is because of Jesus. Jesus foretold that he would die on the cross and then Three days later, he'd be raised to life. Then he pulled it off. And because of that, we believe whatever he taught. So here's what he taught. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus says, Noah was real. The flood happened. And just as the people in Noah's days were supply, surprised by the flood, so it will be for all of us when Jesus comes again. Nobody knows the time, and it will be a huge surprise. So Jesus tells us there was a real Noah. Peter, one of Jesus' apostles, tells us the same thing. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. So Peter says Noah is a real historical creature. But you say, well, this is in the Bible. Why should I believe it? Listen to what Peter says. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. People that wrote the Bible didn't just make it up. But prophets, though human, spoke from God 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He says what you find in the Bible is not just humans making things up. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Parents, I think it's important that you talk with your uh, children about reasons why we can believe in Noah and the flood. God was saddened by the corruption, violence, and evil in the world in Noah's day. And then we read in Genesis 6, verse 8, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor with God. It's very good thing to find favor with God. How do we find favor with God? I mean, every one of us here wants to find favor with God. Since that is such a good thing, how do we find it? Two ways. One, by faith. The writer to the Hebrews, remember here again, the New Testament helps us interpret The Old Testament, what's going on in Genesis 6? By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Noah built the ark. Even though he lived nowhere near the ocean, and it was sunny outside, doesn't rain much in the Middle East. He had faith that God would send a flood, so he built an ark. Verse 9, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. He was a good man. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. So the ark is 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and six stories high. Think of Outson Stadium or Reeser Stadium. The ark would basically fill the whole thing. The weather was nice. So Noah building an ark It may have taken some convincing that God was really asking him to build an ark. So in Evan Almighty, uh, Steve Carroll needed some convincing convincing that Morgan Freeman really was God and was really asking him to build an ark. Watch this again. Penalties early on could be very costly because instead of punting from deep in their own territory, they're already at the midfield right now. Yeah, and that's just that quick throw. Again, it's not a three-step drop. You just... just Dad, what are you doing? I'm watching this. Genesis 6, 14. Gen 6, 14. Joan, do we have a Bible anywhere? Genesis 6, 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Gopher wood. for wood. Get it? Go. Well, it's not really go for wood. I just like the word play. No, it's pine and maple. It was clear cut from this valley to make room for all those houses. Excuse me, do I know you? Not as well as I'd like. I see you got my housewarming gift. That was you? You sent those? What are they for? Hey, hey. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. I want you to build an ark. You want me to build an ark? Yes. So that's why the tools and you are responsible for the wood? Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, let's just start over. Ha ha, hello, 
I am Evan, Evan Baxter. Baxter. Born June 15, 1962. Eight pounds, 11 ounces. Mother's Carol Ann Parker. Father Eugene Evan Baxter. Ooh, you have internet access. Very impressive. Do you also have cable? You're a clean freak. You care much too much about your outward appearance. Your left nipple is a quarter inch higher than your right nipple. And when you were a little boy, you were afraid of Gumby. Who are you? I'm God. You're God? Yes. And I want you, Evan Baxter, to build a mark. Okay, you know what? This conversation is a little thing I like to call over. But I gotta get going. Because, frankly, I have an art to build. Busy, 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 busy. Nice meeting you. Take care. Oh, and... All right, see you later. Shake it off, Evan. It's over. That case is gone. I am successful, I'm powerful, I'm handsome, I'm happy. Successful, powerful, handsome, Evan! Hey. Oh! Get it out, son. It's the beginning of wisdom. How did you get in here? Ah, I'm call the cops. Oh, no, no need. Look, look. There's one right there. Right there. Officer! 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 Car shaker! Car shaker! The car! Car shaker! The car! <gasps> oh! Oh! Careful pulling out. Pedestrian in the crosswalk. All right. All right. So it must have taken a little convincing, huh? Verse 16. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. So put in a big window. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, <clears throat> every kind of animal. Every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and be kept alive. You're to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Uh, People don't build an ark unless they believe there's really going to be a flood. Uh, Noah believed God even though everyone else thought he was out of his mind. Can you imagine the ridicule he received? How people mocked him? How much rejection he felt by people? Uh, Ji Jing, in his book, Rejection Proof, tells how uh, growing up, rejection was the greatest fear he had. He just hated it when he got rejected. And so he, to, to overcome it, he, he entered into 100 days of rejection. He would try 100 different things where he's likely to get rejected so he'd get used to it. Like he went into a Dunkin' Donuts and asked him, uh, could you uh, make me a uh, donuts in the shape of uh, the Olympic uh, emblem? And assuming the answer would be, no, we, we, we don't do that. But instead, the gal said, yeah, I think we can do that. And so she made him, uh, you know, uh, made him that. Uh, so one day he was driving by uh, PetSmart, and he decided it was time for his dog Jumbo to be groomed. Uh, so uh, Jumbo was a golden retriever. They shed all the time. They're always needing to be uh, groomed. And, but he said, that what he's going to do, he's not going to ask for his dog to be groomed, but he wants, he wants to get a haircut. And so he goes in, and he comes up to the counter, and four groomers are there working with dogs. And, and uh, uh, one gal comes over, how can I help you? And he says, you know, how much does it cost for a trim? Well, what kind of dog do you have? He says, well, I'm talking about a trim for me. <laughs> and she says, uh, you know, we don't, we don't do that. Uh, and she starts to laugh. And he said, well, um, you just, just treat me like a German shepherd. And then he realizes uh, what he looks like. Is PowerPoint working or did that stop? There we go. So here he is, and uh, he's realizing what he looks like, uh, that he's Asian. He said, well, you know, could be, uh, think of me as a Tibetan Mastiff. 
or a chow chow. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they're saying, no, nah, we can't do that. But he says, oh, no, I'll be, I'll be good. If you tell me to sit, I'll sit. I won't bark. You know, he's just going on and on, and they're laughing like crazy. And um, be- before the final rejection, he says he decided he would try one more thing. How much, how, how much it would cost to get a manicure? And they just start laughing uh, totally at that point. And so anyway, he leaves, but he feels okay about having gotten a no. Uh, Because in the process, he feels like he had made their day. You can picture the rejection Noah felt. God says to Noah, I'm going to destroy all the earth. I want you to build a boat to save you and your family and all the animals. So Noah drives to Home Depot. He says, I need some wood. And uh, they start loading it up. He says, no, nah, I'm going to need like several truckloads of wood. So Home Depot drops off this, this wood in his front yard, and people are drawing by and say, hey, Noah, what, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a boat. There's going to be rain, lots of it. And they're thinking he is out of his mind. They look at the sky. It's sunny. It doesn't rain much there, and uh, so he spent all these years building a boat in sunny Mesopotamia. But Noah believed God. A teenager, young single, married, empty nester. It's important. Even as you go to work, Maybe school and you feel outnumbered. Maybe you feel rejected for your faith. Faith is believing God anyway. You believe that God created the universe. You don't believe that the universe has always existed. You believe that God created you in His image. You're of infinite value. You believe that there was a first man and woman and they chose to sin. And that the evil we see in this world is caused by human sin and the activity of the devil. You believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You believe that He died for your sins and that He was raised again from the dead. And that if you ask Him to forgive your sins, that He will come and forgive your sins and the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit will Come and live inside of you. We find favor with God by faith. We also find favor with God through obedience. We read that Noah obeyed God no matter how strange God's request. 6.22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. 7.5, Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah obeyed God even though people laughed at him, thought he was nuts. He obeyed God at great cost to himself. It cost a lot to build that boat. Noah obeyed God. He built the ark. Obedience to God isn't just uh, obeying in the big things, like building an ark. It's obeying in the little things. You get a, a nudge from the Holy Spirit that you should do something. Or don't do something? Do you obey? Obedience leads to favor with God. The prophet writes, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. The prophet tells us that God looks over the earth to see who believes in Him and is obedient to Him that He can show His favor to. It's very good to find favor with God. You want it, and I want it. How do we find it? Through faith and obedience. 